You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Monday. That means it is time for Mental Health Monday, and we get to check in with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman here in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin, for your support of The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live uncommon. It is time for Mental Health Monday with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving week. Is that, yeah. Is that what you're Yeah. Yeah. American Thanksgiving week. Our oh, Canadian correct. brothers and sisters have already done their Thanksgiving celebrating. This is you know. true. Good yes, they have. Right? Also, but, yeah, love Thanksgiving. Can I say Happy New Year? We had, we just. Oh, yeah, church year. Didn't, didn't, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Another church year. So, yeah, it feels good to turn a new page, like before, you know, we think we're supposed to turn a new page. <laughs> like, I feel like, yeah, right. it's bring on the end of the church year in 2020 more than ever, right? Mm-hmm. 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 So this is, I believe this is our last in the series on mm-hmm. industry. Is that right? It's true. We're going to cheat a little bit. And November 30th, next week, we're going to start our series on identity, which is going to wrap up our uh, 2020. Uh, so I'm excited to see how those things connect. Like we said, since the beginning, we've been building, right, these stages of development and how they kind of recircle in during our lives. And so this is always applicable. Uh, but you know, this starts to industry uh, wrap up those early elementary years. And then as we move into identity, we're going more toward uh, junior high, middle school and um, high school years in particular. Although I think as a 41 year old woman, I'm ready to say that I'm working on my identity every day while still being grounded in my sure and secure identity in Jesus Christ. So that's what we'll dive into. Yeah. Next week. So then today, what are we diving into in our last one on industry? Roadblocks to oh boy. industry. Roadblocks. Yeah, we <laughs> talked about building it last time. And so I think naturally when you talk about building it, you see some of the roadblocks that you get. But I wanted to talk about three roadblocks in particular that we can zero in on and, and maybe make a little bit of change in our regular places and spaces and vocations in life. And so the first one is, you know, research shows that boredom – is beneficial. And we, especially in America, have very little time for boredom. So the first roadblock to industry is no time for boredom. So maybe we'll ask the Andy and Sarah question first to change up a bit. Uh, (laughs) When and where in your life do you notice your mind wandering? Or when do you uh, leave some time for boredom, if you will? This is a really funny question because I I, I want to say that the answer is like all the time, even though that's not totally true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think if I if I actually think about it, it's when I'm when I'm not actively thinking about something else. Like if I'm focused on a project, obviously, then my mind's not wandering. But if I'm not actively focused on something, my brain is all over the place. Um, wandering down rabbit holes, typically creative ones of like art and color and how I should decorate a room or what the trees look like today, or I don't know, those, those types of, of things. But it's, it, I'm either usually super focused or all over the place. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're going to talk about actually the benefit of what you're talking about, those rabbit holes, if you will, in just a second. How about you, Andy? I, I wouldn't say boredom necessarily, but free thinking happens probably when I'm running or swimming, um, times when I'm not uh, apt to pick up my phone mm-hmm. and, uh, or, uh, or other things that, um, mm-hmm. so it's, it's not things that require focused thinking, although I've become very focused during those times I find um, during swimming or running, um, because those I can just kind of lock into automatic mode and mm-hmm. have that time for free thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is one benefit to exercise, especially that has a little bit of monotony to it, you know, when we're pounding the pavement, or I was surprised that Sarah didn't bring up uh, riding her bike, you know, because (laughs) you are doing this thing for a specific amount of time. And while you're engaged in that activity, it does allow for some space for letting your mind wander, especially if it's something that you do regularly because you are like an expert in it. (laughs) You know how your body feels and what it needs when you're uh, pedaling and where you're at, especially if it's a common route to work, if you will, or things like that. And so, you know, research shows that boredom does 
literally open new pathways in our brain. And so this is a little bit different from what we refer to as like the rabbit hole of social media. Mm-hmm. And you talk about picking up your phone, Andy, you know, that that is going down where we're making associations that social media wants us to make. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, it presents us with this thing that's an ad and then we're looking over here and, and it's all like really pre-programmed and being aware of that is really helpful. Uh, but that's for another episode of Mental Health Monday. Um, <laughs> instead, focusing on when we are... Uh, in more of an like open, safe space that's not directed by anything, then we see our brains light up in different places and we see our neural networks be able to make new um, implications. And, and so boredom really creates new thoughts. It creates new ideas. Um, and so we can definitely ruin this. You know, we like productivity in our boredom. (laughs) You Mm -hmm. know, the goal isn't to create industry in boredom. But at the same time, it is true that boredom uh, research reveals that it does in some ways create some industry because things come out of it. Uh, Boredom also, I think one reason it helps us be more industrious is that it regulates our emotions and refocuses us. And so it's really related to the practice of grounding where we uh, like have a chiropractic appointment and they reset our spine and our back. All of a sudden the whole body feels better, right? When that Mm -hmm. element feels better. Uh, That's the same thing that happens emotionally for us when we have a time of boredom. We see this reset Uh, and it does just, I think, remove the stimuli in our life a little bit. Uh, There's so much input, you guys, as you Mm -hmm. all can appreciate, right? Just things coming at us all the time. And so when we're bored, we aren't engaged with something. We're not... uh, like being uh, fed by that input, we're able to kind of sink back a little bit. And so it just removes some of that stimuli, which helps us instead of be hyper vigilant or hyper focused, get in this healthy grounded place where we feel like we can make uh, better decisions. You know, we feel better about the ideas that come because they don't feel so uh, attributed to our survival and our safety and all of that good stuff. And so that's, you know, bored research. Look it up. It's some good stuff. And I think there's some good books on that out there too. So, so since I did the Andy and Sarah question, are you ready for segment number two or is it time for a break yet, Andy? We've got a little time still. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. I can't keep track of all those things at one time. I, I rely heavily on Andy for that. <laughs> um, so the second one is wanting complete happiness and contentment. And when I say this, I emphasize the word complete right? So as Christians, especially, we can appreciate that while we have completeness in Christ Jesus as our Savior, and therefore we have these fruits like contentment, uh, we will not have the complete version of that either until Jesus comes back again. And so sometimes we strive so much for these things that feel good, honestly, at the end of the day, that we uh, end up getting none of it or getting less of it than we desired. And so it's a spiritual paradox, really. Uh, We have contentment in Christ, uh, but there will continue to be this restlessness on our earthly pilgrimage. And so if you think about industry, like we always want to feel productive. We always want (laughs) to feel like we're doing all the things and doing them well. Um, And the reality is, is we live in a broken world. And so we're not going to experience that full sensation of our purpose and what we offer this world and doing all the good things all the time until Christ comes again. That's a not yet kind of promise. Um, And so Secular science recognizes that even that happiness itself is really fleeting. And as Christians, we're like, we, we like laugh in the face of that. We're like, of course it is. That's silly, right? <laughs> um, but we still seek after it as Christians. We still want the the things that feel good. You know, we're the old Adam and the new Adam inside of us. And so in our vocations, then we often look for a hundred percent happiness, if you will, or a hundred percent industry, especially that sense of productivity and that sense of purpose when really research shows us. And, um, you know, I, I have a special relationship with pastor, uh, Jim Adi in, uh, Texas, and he's 
a mental health professional like I am and also a pastor at a church down there, LCMS pastor. And he taught me the 60-40 rule from his own research. And that uh, teaches us that we should be experiencing some happiness or contentment, a sense of that in about 60% of our vocation. And 40% of it, it's okay if we don't like it. <laughs> it's okay if we don't <laughs> feel like we're doing all the great stuff. Uh, and I think that's really wise. That feels about right, right? That we don't want to be miserable and, and we don't want to feel like we're not having any kind of productivity or we're not able to get anything done in our short time here on earth. We want that sense of purpose and God does bless us with it. Um, but at the same time, it won't always be there. And that's really, really helpful. So I see that it's probably time for a break, huh? Um, and so maybe we can come back to that one when we... All when right. We... Sounds good. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We'll continue Mental Health Monday right here on The Coffee Hour right after this. You're a miracle. You know that, right? A living, breathing, one-of-a-kind miracle. You were created to stand apart, to share your gifts in the service of others, to make an uncommon impact in a common world. And at Concordia University, it's our mission to help you do that, to live uncommon. To learn more about Concordia, go to cuw.edu. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Mental Health Monday with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. We're talking about industry. Today we're talking about roadblocks, roadblocks to industry. And uh, you, just before we went to our little break there, you mentioned the 60-40 rule of what that, that you learned from a, a colleague in a mental mm -hmm. health profession. Uh, can we revisit that, that 60, 40 rule? And then I know you have a question for us. <laughs> Absolutely. Of course. Um, yeah. The 60, 40 rule that we are not going to always be happy and content in every single piece of our work or all of our vocational work. And this is true in family vocations, just as much as it is in um, professional vocations where we go and, and do the things outside the home and things like that. Um, so 60% of the time we're looking for some joy, some contentment, some, um, uh, just feeling a satisfaction, if you will. We're not we're not adulterating these things. Like we, God is obviously still the center of our identity and things like that. But I do think it's important to recognize that there is a place for feeling good about what we do, um, and God and His Spirit works through when we don't feel good about what we do. Uh, the question is whether we're connecting those dots. And so, but it's also okay to have 40% of the time where you're not feeling great about it. It's not your favorite part. Like I love podcasting. I don't love editing the podcast. That's <laughs> one of my least favorite things to do. Or having to get on YouTube every 40 seconds to learn a new skill that has to do with podcasting, you know. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm going to give up because I don't enjoy those like 40% kind of things. Uh, that's the difference between kind of healthy industry in God's kingdom versus chasing after the satisfaction uh, and an ultimate sense of purpose at all times. That's really unrealistic. Um, and so we also have, oh, sorry, there's the there's the game and doggies letting themselves be known. Um, I do have a question for you. And then I have a final thought on that one. So what do you guys enjoy greatly in your vocations? And what parts of them are less fulfilling, if you will, or, or just, you know, are your 40%. And this is true. I want to look at both at home and then also at work, because as Lutherans, we want to uh, appreciate both those vocational spheres. So what do you think, Andy and Sarah? Um, so things that I get to do with my hands, um, well, not everything though, but I, I, you know, I find doing dishes like actually kind of therapeutic, mm -hmm. um, cause it has a beginning, a middle and an end and then it's done. Um, it, but I, as a, you know, as a husband and a, and a dad, um, I like, I like when I have the opportunity to teach my son something, um, to, to have time to teach him something that's 
that's valuable to him that, that he enjoys learning. Um, mm -hmm. The, there are some things, let's see, what do I enjoy less? Um, I like seeing him ride a bike. Uh, I teaching him how to ride a bike is maybe a different story. Um, but <laughs> it's like teaching your teenager to drive. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Only so fulfilling. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and, and maybe he, he enjoys it less for the same reason, because we both just want to get to the goal to the end instead of enjoying the process. Um, uh, and then at work, um, I, I do like um, developing ideas. I like being creative, and I but I do like the hands-on things too. I do like editing. I just wish I had more time to do all of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's. A good I don't point. like being rushed. That's what I don't like. Mm -hmm. I don't like uh, Ooh, about any good. of my vocations. I don't like when any work is has to be rushed. Mm, I love what you just did there too, Andy, is like being able to kind of, when you sit with it for just a second, you get to the heart of what you really feel like eh about. And mm -hmm. that just helps us become aware. So instead of like, oh, I don't like editing. And then when we sit before the editing, we're like, kind of scroogey about it. Instead, well, that's not really what we don't enjoy. It's that rushed feeling. So then we can begin to make some changes that really help us begin to feel a little bit more content within our vocations as well. So I appreciate that too. How about you, Sarah? Oh, I'm I'm in the same boat of of creative things. I at work or at home. I love the creative stuff. I love thinking through um, it, problems, the, the problem solving things, uh, especially in my my work life uh, when there's something that needs to be solved. I love solving things. I love being curious and digging into you know solutions for stuff. That's mm -hmm. really fun. Um, anything that has to do with planning or um, ideation or being productive or getting something done. <laughs> You're talking about, <laughs> we love being productive. I, I like feed off of productivity, um, mm -hmm. and work or at home. And I think in, in home life, I like being a helper. I like caring and taking mm -hmm. care of people. Um, you know, cooking people food. It's really, it's, it, it brings so much joy to like, just be able to mm -hmm. care for someone. Um, and be that person. Stuff I don't like. Um, I don't like repetitive tasks or things that I I did once and have to redo. Um, I hate fixing mistakes, <laughs> uh, which is probably not unusual for people. Um, I, I'm also not a, a very patient person. I hate waiting on stuff. These are all of my secrets today. Um, and <laughs> at home, I just I don't like cleaning. I'm just mm -hmm. it's not my thing. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. And you can see how, like, that doesn't mean we're going to give it up. Oh, no. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> but being honest about, like, oh, that's not my thing, but there's this other 60% that I like, that's what we're talking about for some good mental health in our vocations. Um, the Gottmans, who are my favorite marriage and relational experts from their research, they have a lot of information about what we call the good enough marriage. So this especially applies to our home vocations in this is that they really honestly identify in their marriage that marriages that are healthy and have that sense of satisfaction aren't doing everything awesome and aren't hundred percent just wow. Instead, both partners feel like they're doing good enough. <laughs> like, and I'm like, I love this. And I think like, so while the scriptures say, when you do everything, do it as for the Lord and not for men, I don't know that God expects perfectionism. Like he knows who we are um, and he knows what we're capable of. He knows what we're good at um, and what we need to grow in. God is very growth oriented, which is what this entire series is about, right? And so I think leaning into Christ Jesus and saved by grace alone also means leaning into good enough, <laughs> like good enough in my vocation. I'm not going to be everything everyone needs me to be. And that's okay because Christ is. And so I think, you know, that would probably be a series we could do another another day or something is uh, that's more on that good enough marriage. But I do think that rolls over into other places. So the last roadblock that we have today to industry is a staying out of touch with our gifts and talents. And so I do think we can elevate the idea of gifts and talents and all of that a little bit. Like we don't, again, want to idolize anything. Um, we rely on 
what the needs are that God puts in front of us a lot of times. As a deaconess, this is especially important to me. Uh, the deaconess motto says, what is my want? I want to serve. You know, I'm not always going to be doing the thing that's like, oh, that's my gift. I'm not always giving therapy to people. I'm not always uh, talking about mental health. I'm not always, I don't know, singing or something like that that I really enjoy. Instead, sometimes it's just about what people need. Um, but we can do ourselves a disservice when we disconnect so much from the unique person that God has made us to be and the unique purpose that he has given us in this life. Um, And so we see a greater sense of industry and purpose and vocation, um, contentment, when we have our eyes open to those unique gifts and talents that God has given us. Um, So I'll talk about that a little bit more, but I do want to hear what Andy and Sarah have to say, of course, today on Oh, I had a different question on that one. But first, let's ask, like, what are a couple, just two of your unique talents, your unique gifts that you try to lean into in your vocations? Oh, boy, I wasn't prepared for that one. Um, I know, sorry. Throwing it up there. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't in the (laughs) notes. it's a punches. This is radio, people. (laughs) (laughs) Two unique talents. Um, uh, Connecting dots, creative problem solving. Mm. That's a big one. Um, And seeing... I feel like I keep talking about this, but seeing the creative art side of like everything Mm, that keeps uh coming up, but that's, that's my jam. Well, I would say too, like you said, like I keep bringing this up. Well, good. That means you're (laughs) in touch with your gifts and talents. Like we're talking about, that means you're leaning into that uniqueness that God has given you while not ignoring just what he's put in front of you. Like you said, like I enjoy serving my spouse and doing those things and and I do clean. I don't not do that, but you're leaning (laughs) into those things. That's awesome. How about you, Andy? Uh, yeah, I think this goes back a couple episodes. I'm the why guy. I always ask why in <laughs> when I'm serving in a group or, or even, even in the home too, why are we doing this? Um, uh, uh-huh. not as a, not as a mean thing, but just to keep us uh-huh. uh, it, from my perspective, keep us all on track. It's important to me to know why I'm doing something. And, uh, uh-huh. so yeah, that, that's my gift. I'm the why guy. <laughs> the why guy. Um, I love it. That has to go with, uh, Gretchen Rubin's four tendencies. Have you read that book? I have yeah. not. Um, yeah, one of the tendencies is a questioner. So there's like a rule follower, there's a people pleaser, there's a questioner, and then there's a rebel. And just understanding your tendency and reading other people's tendencies is an important part. But yes, I digress. What's your second thing, Andy? Hmm, I lost it. Um, mm, sorry. Let's see. I, no, I had it right here. Um, well, I, I, again, connecting, and we talked about this before too, connecting the creative and the technology using the... the mm-hmm. Uh, using technology creatively um, for a variety of things like we get to do here on KFUO, but in other places too, using mm-hmm. it to um, for mm-hmm. aesthetics, um, for for family events at, at, at church, okay. uh, the those types of things. Yeah, absolutely. That's so good. And you can see how then, and your technology and creativity one really brings out when the church is dialed into, when our unique local body of Christ is dialed into the members, like what each member has to offer in that, um, that can also help them feel this sense of industry and purpose in the vocations. Because we're not, you know, yes, we can ask people to serve at a meal or yes, we can ask them um, to teach Sunday school or whatever, but what else do they have going? You know, what else that is unique about them? Not only does that give them that sense of purpose um, in using their gifts before God in a very clear manner, it also gives them that sense of belonging in the body of Christ much more strongly. Um, And so that's kind of an important aspect, I think, of industry for us within the body of Christ is that God has a place for all these things. And we need, we need to know that, like that I'm not marginalized because my talent doesn't look like your typical church work talent, or it doesn't look like your typical um, thing that the, the church is looking for, if you will, you know, so leaning into that. And I think that's one good thing COVID has brought forward is that we need a whole lot more gifts than we thought, (laughs) you know, a lot of variety (laughs) in the gifts. Um, And so that is something we can give people as the body of Christ, um, for them to experience uh, God's calling for them in that unique zone. And so just in our last minute here, I wanted to bring up uh, the shame and judgment, especially uh, that we 
oftentimes have inside of ourselves when we don't feel like we're offering the right gift. You know, again, as a mental health professional, just lean into any discomfort you're feeling and get really curious about it. I do think so often we think there's, we talked about this in an earlier episode, like good gifts to offer and like mediocre gifts to offer and then ones that don't matter. Um, And we don't, we don't believe that in the body of Christ. Um, And so nor do we believe that about members of the body of Christ and their vocations out there in the home or, or wherever else they're serving. And so just knowing that God has a place for your gifts and diving into that, asking him questions, dealing with those feelings of inferiority. Um, I think when we come out the other side of that investigation with God, we will have a greater sense of purpose, a greater sense of industry in our lives, more of that 60, if you will, and a little less of that 40 in our vocations. Mm. Good stuff. Very helpful stuff. Thank you, Heidi. Always good to chat with you and uh, learn more. And so uh, next, uh, now we've wrapped up industry. We're Mm -hmm. moving on to identity. Is that right? That is true. We are going to move on to identity. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one. This is some of that really good meat stuff I think that we have a handle on. As Lutherans, it really heavily impacts um, our doctrine, like really impacts and the rubber hits the road, if you will, of what that looks like in our lives together. And um, as individuals just going out there and, and trying to uh, be Christ's hands and feet in the world without losing the individual that he has made me to be in this place, in this space that he's brought me to. Mental Health Monday on the Coffee Hour with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. Heidi, always good to chat with you. Thanks so much. Thanks. See you next time. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.